Good afternoon and welcome to Global Report. I'm your host, Lolly. We have with us today Ambassador Carlos Corrales, who is the Ambassador of Peru to Singapore. Welcome to the show, Mr. Ambassador. Oh, well, thank you very much for your invitation. It's a pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you. Well, Mr. Ambassador, since the last time I saw you, a lot has happened in the world. Of course, I'm talking about the pandemic. Uh, tell us, what is the situation like on the ground in Peru? Well, uh, since March, when the first case uh, was registered officially in my country, um, the Peruvian government decided in the middle of March to um, apply one of the strictest lockdowns uh, in the world. It was a very long lockdown of three months uh, since the middle of March until the middle, three months and a half until the end of June. Um, but the problem is that uh, a lot of people in my country work in the so-called informal sector. So they need to work every day uh, to have an income. So for them, it was a little bit difficult to um, comply uh, all the rules of the government in terms of staying at home. And uh, for that reason, uh, in spite of the lockdown, a lot of, of, of Peruvians were affected by the disease, particularly in some specific towns in the Amazon jungle and in the Andean mountains, and in some specific um, districts in the outskirts of Lima. But, uh, well, the, the situation was very bad in, in spite of the lockdown since uh, July until September, when we reach a very um, difficult peak of 10,000 cases every day. Uh, but now uh, the situation is much better. Um, we are reaching a level of a little bit less than 1,000 cases every day. It's still high, but not as high as in the past. And some epidemiologists uh, of Peru and some others from, uh, from uh, very important countries such as United Kingdom uh, consider that perhaps in some specific areas of Peru, in some towns, uh, in the Amazon jungle in particular, perhaps we have reached the level of herd immunity. Why? Mm. Because apparently between 50 and 60% of the population in those towns were affected, were infected by the disease. And of course, uh, in those towns, very young people leave. So, uh, you know, the most affected people in this case are the, 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 the old people and people with, with uh, pre-existential uh, pre uh, diseases. So, 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 so uh, the situation now is, I think in a, in a process of estabilization. And we have uh, something in favor. Um, summer is about to begin in the Southern hemisphere uh, in one week. So apparently in summer, the spread of the disease is not as high as in the winter. And we are waiting, of course, for the vaccines. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm glad to hear that things are getting a little bit better. Talking about the vaccine, I know that a few days ago, Peru suspended the clinical trials of the Chinese vaccine Sinopharm um, yes. because there was an adverse effect in one of the volunteers. Is that correct? Yes, is that correct? No. Yes, uh, we um, proposed the, the Chinese government to, to have a trial of the vaccine in Peru. And uh, until very recently, the trial was very successful, but uh, one case has emerged. And, uh, and well, we have suspended for the time being uh, this trial. And, uh, but uh, my government um, is uh, willing to continue with this trial perhaps in two or two more weeks. Uh, to have access to the Chinese vaccine, uh, perhaps in the first quarter of next year. Now, well, I think it's very wise. Course, we are very interested in the in in the in the Sinopharm. Well, we are very interested in the in, in the vaccines that have been um, already applied in the in, in the Western countries, uh, particularly in, in the United Kingdom and in Canada. But uh, we are, we have to wait a longer time to have access to those vaccines, perhaps in the by the middle of next year. 
-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's very wise of, of the Peruvian government to, uh, you know, suspend the trials because as much as we need the vaccine, we want to yes. ensure their safety. So until further yes. investigation if, can if be you done. Have, well, if you have only one case that has, that has to face some complications, uh, you have utilized a, a universe of, I don't know, 30,000 people. So it's not very um, dangerous, but you know, you have to- Gotta be careful. To, 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 be, to be very cautious. Right. Well, mm -hmm. let's shift gears and, and talk about trade. I know that even though Asia dwells Latin America in terms of population and GDP, with Asia's rising middle class, there's also been a, a increasing demand for diversified goods. And mm -hmm. you know, with the supply chain disruption brought on by the pandemic, that has also accentuated the need for you know, more diversified supply chain. What kind of opportunities do you see for Latin America in this enlarging market demand? I, yes, individually, bilaterally, every Latin American country uh, don't have a lot of possibilities to reinforce their economic links with Asia if you um, act only individually. For that reason, we have initiated um, um, uh, three years ago a negotiation with Singapore, the Pacific Alliance countries, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, and Chile, to have a free trade agreement with the Singaporean market. Uh, but to utilize Singapore not only as a, as, as, a, as a single market, but to utilize Singapore as a logistics platform to the uh, distribution of our exports to the rest of the region of Southeast Asia and perhaps Northeast Asia too, you know. Uh, so uh, we have been very lucky because recently uh, this block of countries and Singapore have uh, reached a level of substantial conclusion of those negotiations. Uh, we are supposed to finish these negotiations in the first quarter of next year, and perhaps uh, we were in, in, the, in, in the conditions of signing the agreement by April, May next year. What is the added value of this agreement regarding the Asian markets? Well, Peru has, for a very long time, a free trade agreement with Singapore since 2009. You know, what our uh, trade with Singapore has um, increased at the level of 23% as an average every year since the, the signature of this uh, very important agreement for the uh, Peruvian market. Um, Chile uh, has a free trade agreement with Singapore too, you know, but uh, in the context of the P4 countries that uh, paved the way for the TPP that now has become the CPTPP. You know? And uh, Mexico has a free trade agreement with Singapore too. The only country that doesn't have a free trade agreement bilaterally speaking with Singapore is Colombia. So the added value of this uh, agreement of this block of four countries with Singapore is that we can promote the establishment of regional supply chains within uh, the, the block of these four countries, you know, because we can uh, 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 take advantage of the accumulation of rules of origin. We have standardized our rules of origins through this, um, this agreement. We have a specific rules of origin with Singapore, well, in the bilateral agreement, but uh, and, and, and there, are, there are different standards with the other countries. But now we have had only one regime of accumulation of rules of, orig of origin. And that paves the way, in my opinion, to the establishment of very important new supply chains at the regional level regarding our uh, uh, trade exchange with, with, with Singapore. And Singapore is very, very interested in, in Latin America as a supplier of food. You know? The, the, the Singaporean government is trying to develop a sort of ecosystem for the innovation of food industry in, in, in the little red dot here in, 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 in the island. And uh, I, I have had some conversation with, um, with a former uh, 
Minister of State of Trade, Mr. Chihontat, that now is the Minister of State of, 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 of Foreign Affairs here in Singapore. And uh, recently I had a meeting with a new Minister of State of, of, of Trade, Mr. Alvin Tan, that is a very young, promising yeah, his, he politician. is our rising star. Yeah, he's our he's rising, rising star. star. Yeah, and exactly. they are really very interested in the possibility of having access to uh, some uh, um, food that I consider super food, you know, in terms of this nutritional uh, content, uh, these nutritional advantages for the Singaporean population, and not only for the Singaporean population, but for the rest. Of, of, of the consumers here in, in Southeast Asia. So, you know, uh, it's good to hear that there is a focus on agricultural products, but I mm -hmm. know that for the longest time, most of uh, Latin American trade has depended on export of petroleum gas yes, and natural and resources through minerals, yeah, through mining, right? And, but with the shift towards renewables due to environmental concerns, is Latin America following that shift to, towards renewables? Yes, we are very interested uh, through this agreement uh, in uh, reinforcing our cooperation with Singapore and some other countries here in Asia to develop uh, renewable sources of energy in our countries. So we are talking about solar energy, we are talking about wind energy, hydro, electric energy, um, instead of um, energy that is um, produced by you know, fossils, by, by the use fuels, well, oil in particular. No, Peru is not a great producer of oil. We, we don't export oil. Instead of that, we import oil, no, but we produce gas, we export gas, and uh, uh, we export mainly minerals. No, but we are in the process of diversifying the economic structure of our country. We cannot depend only on minerals, uh, uh, because you know the the the, the production of minerals uh, have two specific problems in Peru: the pollution that is um, uh, produced by this kind of of, of industry, you know? and uh, well, in, in not all the companies that have involved in the mining sector in Peru are producers of, of, of pollutants that can contaminate the surrounding landscape. So they can affect the interest of some uh, native communities that are very close to the mines. And this is one of the problem. And the second problem is the, um, the, 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 the need to take into consideration uh, the demands of the population that is affected by uh, these mines by the production of these mines. So uh, we need to solve those problems first um, uh, um, before uh, increasing the production of minerals for, to be exported to the rest of the, of the world. There are two very important uh, mines uh, that are in hands of Chinese companies in my country. You know, uh, Toromocho, that is a copper mine, Toromocho and Las Bambas. And we, well, these, these, these mines have faced some problems in the last few years. Sorry but, to interrupt uh, you here. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. When you say they are in the hands of the Chinese companies, do they own these mines in Peru? Well, they have received concessions to exploit hmm. those mines for a period of 40 years. No? Four zero? Yes, for a period of wow. 14 years. Okay. After that period, of course, the mines are going to be given back to Peru. And how many uh, years are we talking about? How many years have they been? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, 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 I think in the case of Romocho, already 10 years. In the case okay. of Las Bambas, between five and six years. Okay, so, so early but, stage, uh, yeah. but, oh, but these Chinese companies are responsible for approximately a 30% of the production, of the whole production of copper in my country. For that reason, those, um, those investments are so important. But of course, we have uh, as partners, as foreign partners for the mining sector, we have some companies from Canada, we have some companies from UK, we have some companies from Australia, we have some companies from Canada, but also from, from, see, from, 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 from South Africa too, that are operating in my country, not only Chinese ones. Uh, 
But in the case of these Chinese ones, uh, the situation was a little bit difficult. But Chinese, China is our first trade partner. So we need to be very cautious in our relations with, with China. China is, is a very important partner of my country in terms of exports and in terms of investment. So we need to, to curb very cautiously our relations with China. And, and I think that's the dilemma that is facing every country in the world in this strategic rivalry between China and the United States. You know? uh, Peru and Latin America um, naturally uh, were under the influence of, of the hegemon that is located in the northern part of our, of our continent, the United States, that has been a very important country in terms of its influence, historically speaking, in Latin America. But in the last few years, uh, a lot of countries in, in, in Latin America have developed a very, very good economic relations with China. And uh, China has become the first trade partner of, 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 a, of a bunch of very important countries in, in, in Latin America. Uh, well, Brazil. Brazil has uh, China as its first trade partner. And uh, I, think, I think that Argentina, uh, Peru, Chile, you know, uh, well, Argentina, no, Argentina is it's still, I think, Brazil. But, but China is, is, is going to take over very, very soon. <laughs> and, and in the case well, of I, I think as I think as one of the most open economies in Latin America and the Caribbean, let's just call it an LAC country, Peru has done a great job in prioritizing FTAs to yes. promote export-led growth, fueled by the country's natural resources. Yes. Would, would you say there's at least 25 FTA between Asia PAC and Latin America now? At least 25? Yes, we have. We have signed free trade agreements with a lot of countries in Asia. Well, we have a very old connection, as you know, with Asia. Um, well, historically speaking, we have a very large Chinese community in Peru. We have a very large Japanese community in Peru. Mm. So uh, Asia was not um, uh, a very far away, uh, culturally speaking, continent. Well, uh, we were familiarized with, uh, with the Asian culture for a, for, for, for a very long time. And in, in, in diplomatic and political terms, we were very interested in uh, developing uh, 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 and reinforcing links with Asia. And for that reason, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, we uh, developed a uh, diplomatic strategy to become part of, the, uh, of APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. And Peru uh, was one of the last countries to be admitted as a full, as a full economy member of APEC. Uh, along with uh, Russia and Vietnam in 1998, were the last three countries to become members of APEC. And since that time, uh, we have reinforced very actively and very strongly our links with Asia in general. Uh, we uh, negotiated a long time ago a free trade agreement only um, circumscribed to goods with Thailand, for example. Uh, after that, we initiated our negotiations to have a free trade agreement with Singapore in 2007, and finally we signed the agreement in 2008, and it's in force since 2009. Um, we have a free trade agreement bilaterally, bilaterally speaking, with, with Australia, and we have free trade agreements with Japan and Korea. Uh, we negotiated, it was a very difficult negotiation, but finally we concluded satisfactorily with China in 2008 along with the negotiation that we had developed with, with Singapore. And now uh, Peru is uh, a partner of the CPTPP. So we have not ratified the agreement yet. We are in that process. But uh, through the CPTPP, Peru is going to have free access to new markets, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Brunei. And Malaysia and New Zealand. Oh, you know, so uh, our uh, battery, if you want our range of free trade agreements with Asia is very large. And uh, we have been able to ensure preferential access to all these markets. So for that reason, we are very happy. The problem is that uh, the free trade agreement is not enough. The free trade agreement establishes the rules for the economic, uh, for the private sector to begin to play in the new markets, you know? And uh, well, for our, for some of our private companies are a little bit afraid of the huge Asian market that is so, so far away. They prefer to uh, ne negotiate with the companies that are in the neighboring countries of Europe or the United States. 
But some small and medium enterprises are really very interested in, in diversifying as, a, as, as, as an effect of the pandemic. So the, 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 the European market and the American market is a little bit, a little bit depressed. And, uh, and now the, the, the Asian markets are going to recover uh, very fast in 2021. So for that reason, just to, uh, just to add to that, Mr. Ambassador, if you don't mind me uh, raising this, not really a problem, but maybe more of a concern, what I've observed is that it mm -hmm. seems that almost all the formal agreements with Asia are yeah. undertaken by the Pacific Alliance, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico. So mm -hmm. my question is, how can we prevent this further divergence between these four countries and the rest of the LAC countries, because <laughs> <laughs> they seem to have very few, if any, FTAs with Asia. How can we bring the rest on board? Because um, I don't yes, think it's I good understand. to have to have too uneven a participation, right? Don't you agree? How can we bring them on board? Too? Yes. Uh, well, um, you know, uh, the largest economy in Latin America is the Brazilian. It's a huge country. And uh, uh, Brazil, um, during the government of Mr. Lula, uh, was very interested in reinforcing its links with South America. They created a sort of community of South American states, the union of South American states. And Brazil was the leader of this initiative. And uh, apart from that, uh, there is a, a common market uh, that is comprised of uh, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. Its name is Mercosur. But they have some problems among themselves. <laughs> uh, do, and, does, uh, uh, does the Pacific Alliance and Mercosur, do they talk to each yes, other? Do this, they collaborate? There's four countries that are um, in front of the Pacific Ocean. And the, on the other side, you have these other four countries that are very close to the Atlantic Ocean. So Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. Of course, we have established a dialogue between the Pacific Alliance and Mercosur to, to widen uh, our markets to these very important countries. Peru has a free trade agreement with Brazil. Peru, that's an individual country, no? and we have a free trade agreement with Argentina, uh, but not a block the four countries of the Pacific Alliance. Uh, so um, I think, and some of the economic sectors of Brazil and Argentina are still protected by some rules that are still in force in these countries. So they are not very wide open to foreign investment uh, like uh, other countries such as Chile and Peru. So I think that uh, they need to review their policies and to assess if it's convenient for them to have a, 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 a more open access to international markets and to uh, allow a, a more active participation of foreign companies as, as investors in their economies. Uh, Mr. Macri, the former president of Argentina was in that way, but now with the election of Mr. Fernandez, and the situation has changed a little bit. And in the case of Brazil, uh, the government of Bolsonaro uh, considered that the main trade partner of Brazil should be United States. In spite of the fact that the main trade partner of Brazil is in real terms China. <laughs> but I, I think that they, they need to evaluate all this situation. You know? uh, but in spite of the political will of the current Brazilian government, the real situation is that China is a, a very important trade partner of Brazil and is going to be that way for a very, very long time. Even yeah, I, I, I don't think yeah, I, I don't think we can deny the fact. I mean, it took Asia just two decades to become the second largest trading partner of Latin America and to own two thirds of its FDI investment stocks. I mean, so many opportunities exist between Latin America and Asia. But you know, with opportunities come challenges. What are some of the current and upcoming challenges you see in this LAC Asia relationship? Challenges. Um... Yes, uh, we need to 
develop our productivity and competitiveness as countries in Latin America to be at the same level of some countries here in Southeast Asia. So we need some time, at least, of, 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 of policies that need to be applied consistently for a long period of time in our countries to reach better levels of productivity and competitiveness. Uh, and that's the situation of my country in particular. We have uh, approved uh, uh, last, in 2019, a new plan uh, uh, for competitiveness and productivity that is going uh, to be applied for a period of 10 years. And uh, we have, for the first time in the whole history of my country, we have approved a plan to improve infrastructure. I think that infrastructure is one of the challenges that uh, Latin America is facing in its relations with, uh, with uh, Asia. Uh, well, there is a long distance between Latin America and Asia. So we, don't, we have not been able to establish direct maritime routes uh, between some of the countries of the Pacific Alliance and Asia. We need to, at least in the case of Peru, uh, well, the ships, the transport, our exports need to go to Panama or to the United States and from then to China or to Japan or to Southeast Asia. So, and our ports are not developed enough. So we need, well, there, is a, there is a good news in the case of Peru. Um, China is building uh, in, in, in a very, in, in, a, in a port that is located very close to El Callao, that is the main port of, of, of Lima, a new port. You know, its name is going to be Chancay. A, a Peruvian mining company is, uh, is, is a partner of this Chinese initiative and uh, it's going to be a port to export mainly minerals and some other products. And the uh, Chinese government is going to, they have told to our government that they are willing to establish some direct maritime routes between Shanghai, the port of Shanghai and the port of Tianjin in China. So uh, I think that's a good news in terms of the development of our infrastructure. We need to have more roads, we need to have uh, more railways all along the Peruvian coast. Uh, so uh, if we uh, are able to develop our infrastructure in the, in, in the period, in the next 10 years, I think we're going to have in a much better position to have a, 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 a more interesting trade exchange and investments with, with the Asian countries in particular. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. You know, our time is up. I wish we could keep talking, uh, but thank you so much. And I, before we go, I just want to congratulate uh, Peru too on the accession to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia. I think we need to drink a toast to that and to the upcoming signing of the FTA between Singapore and the Pacific mm -hmm. Alliance. That is going to be fantastic. Fantastic. Yes, and, and the 40th anniversary of diplomatic relations between <laughs> Singapore and Peru. So lots of congratulations. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very for, much. Thank you for your time today. And I hope that the two regions and the two countries can continue this positive trend in yes. collaboration, business and trade. Thank I am you optimistic. so much, sir. I am optimistic. Yeah. Thank you very much for, I will for stop this by opportunity. Soon. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.